Welcome to this webinar today titled Alcohol and Type 1 Diabetes, What You Need to Know. My name is Robbie Tyson. I'm an accredited practicing dietitian and credentialed diabetes educator. So today in this session, we're going to be looking at diabetes and alcohol use. So can those two coexist? We're going to go through and look at alcohol and the regulation of insulin when someone's consuming alcohol. Uh, we'll look at safe levels, if there are any, for alcohol consumption, um, how to minimise any risk when consuming alcohol if that um, is occurring and living with type 1 diabetes, uh, and what complications can be exacerbated in diabetes if uh, alcohol is consumed. So first of all, we're just going to do a refresher on the digestion uh, that occurs in the body when someone doesn't have diabetes. So remembering that carbohydrate foods are the um, main fuel source for the body, such as uh, starchy vegetables, pastas, uh, grain foods, such as bread, as in this example. So it's broken down in the stomach, glucose is released and glucose enters the bloodstream. Uh, the body recognises that the glucose has entered the bloodstream and is heading for the uh, cells of the body, sends out appropriate amounts of insulin to unlock the cells to let the glucose, in this case, into the muscle cell, to be then converted to a universal form of energy and used by the body. So the pancreas obviously secretes insulin and insulin's job is to get that glucose out of the blood. In normal carbohydrate metabolism, as we've just seen, carbohydrates would be ingested. There's an increase uh, in blood glucose levels. Carbohydrates break down to glucose. Only glucose can exist in the blood um, in terms of all forms of sugar. Pancreas then stimulates um, the release of insulin. There would be an increased amount of insulin in the blood uh, to cope with the amount of glucose that's entered. Glucose is then up, uh, taken up by the muscles and cells of the body for conversion to energy to be used by the cells of the body. <clears throat> so meanwhile, at the same time, um, the glucose production uh, that can occur by the body is ceased by insulin. So that extra glucose um, that's not used for energy um, is then converted to glycogen, which is long chains of glucose all stuck together and stored in the liver. So the blood glucose levels then return to their normal range. So we've got glucose that's entering the bloodstream. It's being either used for energy production and, or it's heading to the liver and other places for storage in long chains of glucose are uh, known as glycogen. In type 1 diabetes, however, we've got decreased insulin in the blood because the pancreas is not making any insulin. Uh, that leads to decreased um, glucose uptake by the muscles and liver. So in, in short, they're in a bit of a starvation mode and the storage of glucose in the liver isn't occurring either because it's unable to get into the blood sorry, into the muscles. And that's because the glucose that should be entering into those cells to be used as energy or stored is remaining in the blood. So we've got an increased level of glucose in the blood. So the stored glycogen that we talked about, which is the long chains of glucose all stuck together in the liver, uh, those ones start to be broken down to be used as energy uh, because there isn't enough um, coming through the blood. Obviously, it's not getting out of the blood. And then fat also rapidly breaks down as well to provide energy for the body. Um, and that can lead to the byproduct of um, fat metabolism being ketones. And those are acidic uh, molecules. And if that builds up to a certain amount, we're going to end up with ketoacidosis. So risks associated with alcohol consumption in diabetes. Well, it depends on whether the person is in the fed or the, the fasting state. So there's going to be worsening blood glucose control overall though. So people who consume, um, people with diabetes, sorry, who consume alcohol, that worsening of blood glucose control will happen depending on what's happening. So long-term use of alcohol with people living with diabetes who are well nourished and obviously eating regularly, um, it can result in excessive blood glucose levels um, because we've, we're now intaking another form of energy being alcohol and the body will use that energy source first before using um, glucose and uh, fat or protein for energy. 
Long-term alcohol injection ingestion in people with diabetes who are not adequate, adequately nourished, obviously they're going through periods of starvation, missing meals, can lead to dangerously low levels of um, blood glucose levels. So the effects are going to differ quite a lot depending on whether the alcohol consumption occurs when the person has just eaten and blood glucose levels are relatively high, so that will be in the fed state, or when the person hasn't eaten for several hours and the sugar levels are actually relatively low, so the fasting state. So the effects of alcohol consumption in the fed state um, for people living with type 1 diabetes, uh, single episodes of alcohol consumption in this state are um, not really going to lead to clinically significant changes in blood glucose levels because they've got the, um, the body's in that fed state and it's able to uh, maintain blood glucose level control. However, chronic alcohol consumption in the fed state, which would raise blood glucose levels, and that would result actually in hyperglycemia, high blood glucose levels, um, as opposed to alcohol consumption in the fasting state, which is quite different. And that can result in a dropping of the blood glucose levels to a very low level of hypoglycemia. So in the fasting state, what's happening is there's two major me mechanisms going on for maintaining blood glucose levels. And that's um, necessary to pro provide energy to the body and to the brain. So first of all, you've got the breakdown of glycogen, which is the long chains of um, glucose stored in the liver, for example. And you've got the production of glucose. Okay, that's from uh, carbon skeletons of other uh, molecules like amino acids, etc. Okay, so we're making glucose at the same time as breaking down of glycogen to keep those um, blood glucose levels under control. So we're doing this because it's the fasting state and there's not enough carbohydrate coming in. So generally, the glycogen that's stored, um, the, the glycogen that stores glucose, it's supplied and in the body, and we've got enough there for about 24 hours. After this. Um, that supply has run out. So someone has been consuming alcohol and maybe not eating for a day and they've exhausted their glucose levels, um, is going to find that they're unable to make new glucose uh, from, from non-carbohydrate sources. Um, that's primarily occurring in the liver. Um, and the alcohol that they're consuming is going to block um, this from happening. So the two reactions can't occur simul simultaneously. So the body will choose the alcohol and it'll break that down first and it postpones the production of any new glucose from um, non-carbohydrate sources. So if we've got no carbohydrates coming in to try and maintain blood glucose levels and the carbohydrate stores in the body are depleted, which is in the liver, as we said, uh, and the body isn't able to make new glucose because that's um, halted by the ingestion of alcohol, uh, then the blood glucose levels are going to drop. Okay, and that leads to the hyperglycemia. Okay, in the presence of alcohol, this is an example of insulin regulation. Uh, assuming the person doesn't have type 1 diabetes, we'll look at what happens without type 1 diabetes, sorry, with type 1 diabetes after this, but it's essentially the same thing. However, there isn't um, any insulin at all. So we've already seen that poor food intake can lead to depleted glucose um, levels. Obviously, we've got depleted glycogen, which is the stores of glucose in the liver there. Continued alcohol metabolism is going to result in the ongoing decrease of um, production of new glucose from other sources. So both th this depletion of stored glucose and the diminished ability to make new glucose is going to lead to the lower blood glucose levels. Um, so, but as blood glucose levels fall, the insulin secretion itself, assuming someone um, has insulin available to be secreted, is reduced as well. And because insulin levels are lower and insulin would normally restrain glucagon secretion, um, lower levels of insulin will allow normally increased glucagon secretion. So that would tell the body to send any available stored glucose into the blood. But without insulin to get the glucose into the cells, the body would head into starvation mode. And it starts rapidly breaking down stores of fat. Uh, and this process releases uh, ketones, which we said are acidic. And the buildup of ketones in the body can lead to ketoacidosis. So this situation can be amplified if the drinker is repeatedly vomiting, leads to dehydration, uh, reduced blood volume, and that can lead to increase in catecholamines, which are some stress hormones, and that will further decrease any insulin production and increase glucagon production as well. So the mechanisms generally that are underlying the development of alcoholic ketoacidosis are complex. However, the typical contributing factors generally are going to result in an insulin lack of and an excess of glucagon, and thereby that promotes the development of ketoacidosis or the breakdown of fat um, rapidly to release these ketones into the blood. 
So the risks associated with alcohol consumption in diabetes and what's happening with blood glucose levels. So we've already said alcohol-induced hypoglycemia that typically is going to occur in people both with and without diabetes who've been drinking alcohol for days but haven't eaten. Okay, that's one scenario. Um, hyperglycemic unawareness. So this can be altered um, as some of the symptoms of hyperglycemia can be similar to being intoxicated, um, such as slurred speech, reduced concentration, headaches and vomiting, for example. So this makes it not just challenging for the person with diabetes, but also for carers or healthcare professionals, et cetera, to be able to actually recognise those hypos. Okay, so we'll move on to a case study here. We've got Richard, for example, uh, 45 years old, sales representative, uh, type 1 diabetes for 23 years. So he has twice daily pre-mixed insulin uh, rather than basal bolus, just for convenience. No regular monitoring of blood glucose levels. And his glycemic control is not where he'd hope it to be at 8.9%. So moving on, he has a bucks night to go to. His usual insulin dose um, is at dinner, and he has his usual dinner. Um, on the night out, he drank five glasses of wine over the course of the evening, and he left the party at 1 a.m., uh, and his friends kicked on. So 3 a.m., he was found drunk and disorderly with slurred speech, incoherent and argumentative, passed out in jail. Uh, and the ambulance have picked him up with an unconscious hypo. Blood glucose level around 1.5. So in this situation, we can see that some of those um, symptoms that he's got there, slurred speech, incoherent, argumentative, could be noted as drunk and disorderly, but for him, it was just a hypo. So in his situation, he's had his normal amount of insulin. However, he's consumed alcohol, and the alcohol has been the barrier in there for the blood glucose levels to be able to be replenished because the body can't make any new, new glucose from other sources and it also can't replenish blood glucose levels appropriately from stored um, glucose in the liver because the, breakdown of, uh, because the breakdown of the alcohol is occurring first and that takes precedence over the other two. How much is too much? General advice, well, maximum two standard drinks a day with two alcohol-free days. So we're just looking at the general guidelines here. Standard drink, midi of beer, or the small glass of wine. Um, so, well, to control or lose weight, cut down. What are we saying here? Basically, that energy, the energy density of alcohol is quite high, almost as high as um, fat. So, not that beer, for example, has much sugar in it at all, but it does contain a lot of kilojoules. Excess kilojoules can make it difficult to maintain weight. If our weight is above where we'd like it to be, it interferes with how well insulin works in the body which is then going to interfere with um, our ability to be able to maintain blood glucose levels appropriately. So good idea to have with food, obviously because of the reasons in terms of um, absorption and we need to have that extra carbohydrate to be able to replenish the blood glucose levels because the body, when breaking down alcohol, won't be able to maintain or regulate blood glucose levels um, as, as it normally would. So some additional advice for people living with diabetes. Uh, more than four standard drinks, um, treatment may be needed. Okay, so you might, treatment adjustment may be needed, meaning we might need to have some extra carbohydrates uh, and just keep an eye on that throughout that period. Um, increase checking of blood glucose levels because they can go up and down, so we're going to increase the frequency of those. So low alcohol light beers are a better choice than the regular or the low carb beers because they're lower in alcohol. Less energy means less energy density. Uh, which means better for managing weight. Remember with mixing drinks, try to choose the um, drinks that are the artificially sweetened ones rather than the ones that have got full sugar. Alcohol and type 1 diabetes, well, we've got to be prepared. Plan ahead, pace yourself. Um, avoid drinking on an empty stomach, again, because we need to make sure we've got some carbohydrate coming in at the same time that alcohol is, um, or at least throughout that period. Avoid drinking alone. Make sure we've got uh, someone there who knows you have diabetes and is aware of how to treat hypos, et cetera. Um, checking blood glucose levels more frequently is important. Um, it might be an idea to check blood glucose levels just before bed as well, okay, because we could be trending down. We won't want to have that overnight hypo. Um, ensure that we've got a snack or drink and, and plenty of fluids on board as well. So we, we might need to adjust the dose, but insulin still needs to be uh, given, but the dose might need to be adjusted depending on the blood glucose levels. 
setting an alarm for a blood glucose check overnight can be important as well if we're consuming alcohol and living with type 1 diabetes, again, to prevent that overnight hypo. What can be damaged in terms of chronic alcohol use? Well, lots of areas, obviously, when we're looking at the main organs of the body, brain and nervous system. We know about that damage to esophagus, um, part of the cardiovascular system. Obviously, the part of the body that digests and metabolizes it, stomach, liver and pancreas. Um, we can already see through the pancreas what gets a little bit messed up there with the insulin and glucagon hormones when we're consuming alcohol. And then reproductive organs as well. Um, and fetus if someone was pregnant and consuming alcohol at the same time. So liver and pancreas, the ones we'll focus on here. So we've got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is essentially without the consumption of alcohol, the liver tends to become a little bit fatty um, and that interferes with how well the body can break down uh, carbohydrate and also maintain blood glucose levels and how well insulin the body can work in general. Alcoholic fatty liver disease, well, the overconsumption of alcohol and chronic consumption, the body tends to break down that alcohol first, putting pressure on uh, the body to metabolize it. We then tend to store uh, more of the other molecules, such as fat, okay? That becomes more of a storage rather than being used as alcohol becomes a primary fuel for the body. And then that'll lead to this fatty um, liver situation. If that goes on for a long period of time, there's damage to the cells of the body and they, of the pancreas. And they, if they become too hardened, it can become uh, cirrhotic, which is liver cirrhosis. Other risks associated with alcohol consumption in diabetes and uh, the pancreas, if we look at that, well, pancreatitis can be quite high. 22% um, of acute pancreatitis is related to alcohol uh, consumption. Uh, and that risk is going to increase depending on the duration, uh, if that duration is increased and the amount um, and frequency of alcohol consumption. There's also further risk of pancreatic cancers um, with alcohol uh, consumption as well and for someone living with diabetes. Other considerations, well, moderate or heavy alcohol consumption is going to change um, our risk for other diabetes um, complications or risks of any adverse outcomes. And we've seen what happens with the pancreas and the insulin and glucagon situation when the body is trying to metabolize alcohol um, and maintain uh, appropriate blood glucose levels. So if it's repeated and frequent alcohol consumption, there's going to be an increased risk of um, adverse outcomes for diabetes. Uh, goal of diabetes treatment, obviously, is trying to avoid any chronic complications and then in the short term acute. So alcohol is obviously a modifiable risk factor. So by reducing that, we really decrease the risk of any um, adverse complications. Alcohol consumption is a marker for poor adherence. So we know frequent alcohol consumption tends to interfere with a person's ability to have a good blood glucose profile um, and potentially other self-care behaviours as, as well that are related to diabetes, like actual general monitoring, um, ma making it to appointments, all that sort of thing. All right, thanks very much for attending this webinar today. If you've got any further questions, remember we've got our health professionals on board and they can be talk, contacted via the NDSS helpline number, which is there, 1-800-637-700. Thanks again.